Um, so this is the this is my talk called "How the NPM CLI Team Manages Almost 100 Open Source Projects." And I think when I submitted to the CFP, we had about 94, and since then we've deprecated a bunch and given a bunch away. So we're now in like the 80s, I think, which is really exciting. I love to give stuff away, <laughs> um, give projects away. But um, a little bit about myself first. My name's Luke. Uh, Luke Carries. I live in Arizona. Um, I'm on the NPM team. I'm not sure if you can see it on the projector. There's, um, that's a place I like to go, ride my bike from my house. So I live in the desert. It's the opposite of here. Um, there's no green. <laughs> um, but you can contact me at uh, any of those places. And um, the reason I needed so much help getting HDMI connected was uh, this is the last, this would be preparing for my last talk. And then this is me preparing for this talk. So um, sans beard, um, you know, only one kid. Now there's multiples, they outnumber us. Um, and so this is, I think it's about eight years since my last talk. So um, feels good to be back up here doing, um, talking about JavaScript. Yesterday. What? You did talk yesterday. I did not talk yesterday about uh, sports betting. I did not. <laughs> All right, so um, like I mentioned, I'm on the NPM team. Um, I've primarily spent the last two years uh, as part of this NPM CLI team. So we are responsible for, um, currently these are all numbers as of this morning, <laughs> um, 78 packages uh, that are across 78 repos, um, about 19,000 stars across those, which is not enough in my opinion. I think there's 70, 70 repos of everyone in here stars all 70 repos, I think we can add a few thousand before the end of the day, it'd be nice. I have a script you can all run after, just uh, uh, GH star all of NPM. Um, and then all together, that is about 4.3 billion monthly registry downloads across our full open source portfolio. So that includes um, Semver, Witch, um, hosted get info and a few others, which are the top downloads. Um, and a lot of our download metrics don't um, even account for registry downloads because the CLI itself bundles all of our dependencies. So um, there's there's a lot of downloads. <laughs> um, and that means we have a lot of users. So um, these are our responsibilities as uh, engineering team. Um, there's currently um, between two and four ICs working on the NPM CLI at any given time over the last two years. So um, between two and four ICs, we have um, weekly and biweekly um, NPM CLI releases. We're currently in a bi-weekly um, cadence due to me, you know, being here for a few weeks and a, a few other um, staffing changes. Um, all the NPM CLI dependencies um, and all the releases for those, those happen um, on an ad hoc basis as needed, but I actually forgot to run the numbers for those, but across all 78 packages, uh, we definitely average at least a few releases a week as part of the CLI releases. Um, and so over the last year, uh, I can't do the math, but <laughs> it's a lot, um, a lot of, a lot of CI running because of us. Um, and we also are first level support. So we do issue triage, um, and pull request review for community pull requests across all of our repos. Um, and as well as community engagement with like the RFC call that we have, um, and open office hours. Um, those are currently on hold as well due to some staffing changes, but uh, <laughs> um, we were switching between office hours and the RFC call. So the RFC call is more structured where we discuss specific RFCs um, pertaining to NPM and then open office hours is like kind of come and ask us questions, which <laughs> some of you in the crowd I have uh, recognized uh, take full advantage of. Um, and then we also do, uh, we have bug bounties that we don't triage ourselves. That's part of um, the GitHub security team does that, but the, um, they get escalated to us and those become priority. We um, fix those as well. And then um, this all, we also ensure this all is supported across, uh, works across all supported versions of Node. So we run integration tests across um, all supported versions of Node, nightly Node, um, as well as um, top packages in the NPM ecosystem. So we run tests like for, um, what are some that recently bubbled up with actual bugs? Um, uh, create uh, Rewired, uh, I forget what the actual name of the package is, but the Create React app um, has a plugin called Rewired, which like rewires your um, Create React app config. And we found um, a bug in NPM when we were uh, publishing version nine um, RCs. So we run tests against a bunch of top packages 
Um, and then we also do backports, uh, which is something new we just started. We figured we did not have enough to do. So now we, we wanted to de develop a system so that we could backport any and all of our features to old um, release lines. Uh, most recently, we, I think we backported a security um, dependency fix to uh, NPM 8. And it's possible there could be more backports you know, to NPM 6 um, as well. I know there's a few people here as well which uh, <laughs> would have been asking for those. But we at least have a system now to do backports. It used to be uh, very difficult, if not uh, impossible. Um, so then our other, you know, those all fit under the umbrella of open source. Um, the MPL, I see our main responsibility as open source. Like, what does that <laughs> even mean? Um, it's, a, it's a big umbrella, but um, hopefully I plan to go through, like, how um, our approach to open source and what we consider kind of our responsibility within open source um, as well as the node, uh, the node ecosystem in general. So um, the first thing I want to say is that everything we do is open. Um, this is... A, the new GitHub um, code search, it, I, um, I'm not sure if you can see the query, probably not, but uh, searching for in the GitHub org, um, or in the NPM org uh, is private. Um, and this is me logged in, obviously authenticated to see private repos and nothing comes up <laughs> um, for the NPM CLI topic. So we have a big GitHub org um, that is the registry and the CLI combined and we put a topic on all of our repos and all of those um, are currently open source. We have one, repo in a different org, which we use to triage um, security private security vulnerabilities. And that is our, um, our currently our only um, private repo. So that, that includes our status board is public, um, our future roadmap is public, all of that is um, open source. Um, and everything is open. Uh, you can sing that to the, the, the Lego theme song that my kids sing all the time. Um, I couldn't write that without singing it in my head. Everything is open. Um, <laughs> So uh, the other thing we want to do is open source that scales. Um, I already mentioned the 4.3 uh, billion download a month mark, um, but that's not really the kind of scale I'm talking about. Like that kind of scale is separate from open source. Like our, um, um, our approach, to, we want our approach to open source to scale. Like we don't, uh, we also want our, you know, the end product, the code to scale as well. Um, and, you know, the registry to scale and all of that to scale. But we also want our, um, what we can do to support open source to scale. So uh, when I joined the team about two years ago, we had um, a lot of issues around that. We had like um, a, bunch, <laughs> a bunch of repos that like were maybe deprecated, maybe archived, uh, maybe attached to packages that were deprecated, but the repo wasn't archived, um, stuff like that. A lot of mismatched um, expectations as far as like what was supported um, within our open source um, portfolio. Um, and so, um, we also want to really quickly be able to open source new things that we find um, helpful and valuable and, and be able to do stuff like that. Publish new packages. Um, we see ourselves as solving a lot of novel problems in the JavaScript ecosystem. So if we have a solution, we want to make sure we can open source it, but not just throw it over the wall style open source. We want to make sure people can use it. We can support it. Um, they can ask questions, we can take people's, uh, we can collaborate on it. Like when we open source something, we absolutely always want to be able to collaborate, collaborate on it with, um, within the ecosystem because our style of open source is like, we're not gonna do everything perfectly, but we want to um, basically not have years long pull requests that are open. We, we recently went through um, Semver, INI, and I believe one other one and got them down to just a core set of pull requests that are still um, open, meaning like those open pull requests are things we are considering. Everything else has been closed or merged after like um, years long <laughs> uh, period of time that they were, um, that they were open. Um, and so, like I said, everything is open source. This is our status board, which is also open source. You can see the link in the corner to see the status board um, that also has uh, on the status board, there's a link to um, the GitHub repo for it. But you shouldn't be able to read all this, but it's essentially just to show that everything that is open source, we want to be able to measure and look at and support. So if something is not on this list, it means we're not necessarily tracking it. Um, if you do find something that's not on this list that you, you know, that you use that is published by us or in our GitHub org, you know, let me know, open an issue on it, tag me in it, and... Um, I add the NPM CLI topic to the repo, and then that adds it to the status board. Um, it runs once a day, pulls in all sorts of data so that we can 
see how green we are. Um, I think currently, <laughs> yes, um, some people here helped build it and helped uh, have ideas for <laughs> what we could use it for because it used to be uh, a lot more red than this. Actually, this amount of green is like shockingly good. And this was also taken um, this morning. I <laughs> uh, uh, did a bunch of extra screenshots this morning just to make sure all my um, data was up to date. Um, so the other thing we want to do is, as I mentioned, share this, this open source. So um, open source is, you know, by definition open. We can share it with people. But I really mean, like, collaborate and share it with people. So, like, when we open source a solution, we want other people to use it. So um, the newest member of the NPM CLI family is NPM Agent. Uh, I believe we did 1.0.0 in December. And then 1.1 is open right now with a bunch of new features. And this is uh, a new HTTP agent that will be in the CLI that will allow for like much more configurable timeouts um, and stuff like that that the NPM CLI currently doesn't allow for. There's only one way, one uh, very um, uh, not granular way to configure timeouts in the CLI currently. So this will help that, but this can also be used by anyone that needs um, an HTTP agent with you know, configurable timeouts and stuff like that. So um, we are not just open sourcing stuff just for ourselves. We are the primary user of all of our stuff, but if we use it, we want to make sure that um, other people can use it because that means it's easier for us to, to use it as well. Across um, that many repos that we have, like there's still ones I think that I've probably not committed to um, yet in two years. Um, and that just means, you know, that just goes to show how much stuff we do support. But, um, you know, I, so there's, there's re, uh, repos of ours that I approach as a new, a new contributor sometimes, even being on the team for um, two years. So um, as I mentioned, we want to be able to support all this open source. So it's a big um, area of responsibility that we have. Um, and as I mentioned, um, there's a lot of things that can happen when you have a portfolio that big. Um, we, my probably worst bug was when I published the CLI um, and manually published the dependencies that are part of it, the workspaces, and just missed the very last one. And since we bundle our dependencies, I didn't see it as a bug like in running my system, but then probably like overnight, um, we just got a flood of bug reports that you couldn't use Yarn um, anymore to install that version of NPM because they handle um, stuff slightly differently, um, as you might have noticed in Darcy's talk yesterday. Um, and so that was a fun one to figure out why it was breaking in one system and not, not another. Um, and this was kind of a time when we were like in a transition between automating some of this stuff and not. So I was like, you know, I know exactly how to publish the CLI. Like, let me just publish all these workspaces. And I, I'm pretty sure I just uh, left one letter off like the very last command that I ran and it didn't, um, I didn't look at the, all the generated output at the end, just um, saw that most of them, you know, saw that there was green and that the CLI was working and, you know, all of our tests pass. But um, that was an interesting one. And that approach to open source, I think, um, doesn't scale. And we can't support that if, like, we're not running all of our code across a bunch of different systems. Um, and so I consider that, like, open, if, if stuff like that is happening, we don't feel confident in, you know, supporting that much open source. Um, so, or we want to deprecate it. <laughs> we want to support it or we want to deprecate it. Um, as I mentioned, I think in the last like six months, we've gone down a bunch of repos. Um, Isaac, the original uh, creator of NPM, took a bunch back. Stuff that was like uh, Node Tar, um, uh, Darcy, what was the other one? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, Did you start to lose What? Yeah. Yeah, it all got passed by, by legal. So um, th this was a case where, you know, um, I, if you're not familiar with the, you know, the details of the NPM CLI, that's okay. It's not super important, but, you know, it makes heavy use of tar balls um, and tarring and untarring stuff and streaming um, tar and stuff like that. And we are not the, Isaac, the original maintainer, he's the expert in tar. And so we make heavy use of it, but we weren't supporting it to our the level that we wanted to. Like people were coming to us with bug reports and I remember looking at the repo and saying like, you know, someone had a one line fix to make it work in like node 18 when node 18 was just released and our whole test suite passed, but I wasn't 100% confident that that one line of code, um, you know, it was just making something wait slightly longer in an async setting. And so I wasn't 
as a not the subject matter expert in tar, I wasn't super confident in merging that. So that bug, uh, that PR um, sat open for a long time, and that's um, not the level of open source support we want. Um, we want people to be able to, you know, have confidence in giving us pull requests that we are going to merge them or close them with good reason, not just let them sit open and say like, I don't feel confident um, merging this. So we want to give stuff away. <laughs> you know, we want to make that status board smaller, eventually fit on one, one slide, hopefully. Uh, I could not get it to fit on one slide, even like shrinking everything as much as possible as I could um, in my browser. So um, this happened again recently with our CI detect module. Um, that package, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with that, but it essentially just looks at a bunch of en environment variables and tells you whether or not you're in uh, a CI environment. And so someone opened this and said, hey, uh, can you document like what the maintenance status of this is? And we had actually switched in the CLI to a different, better, in my opinion, <laughs> and all of our opinions, um, package do CI detection um, developed by, uh, it's in the Watson GitHub org, so I'm not sure exactly what company is responsible for it or um, what maintainers are responsible for it, but it was just a lot better to us and was keeping track of, um, uh, by definition, I think CI detection is like something that's constantly moving and constantly changing. You have to stay up on pull requests um, if you want to be, you know, have the best possible package there. And so ours had a bunch of open pull requests. Theirs had been merging stuff like that, so we just switched to it in the CLI. But what, what we forgot to do was um, archive this repo or deprecate this package. So um, this person came by the repo and asked the question. I responded and said like, you know, yep, this completely fell through the cracks. Sorry about that. We didn't, um, that's not, this is, this wasn't part of our process at the time of like, if we stopped using something, um, what happens to it? It is now where um, it will actually bubble up on status board if you either deprecate the package or archive the repo and just remind you to uh, do the other one as well. But it's not a, um, I, I consider it like really lucky when main, when people come by and ask us questions like this because the alternative for every one person that asks this question, there's I don't know a hundred, a thousand that are looking at the repo and just saying like, this is really frustrating. I can't tell if this is used or not. If this is maintained, I don't want to use this. You know, how can I figure this out? So we want that to be like a binary question of looking at our open source portfolio. Is like, is it maintained? Yes. If it's not, you get the big archived. GitHub um, bar at the top of the repo, and if you go to the NPM package, you get the big um, deprecated up at the top with hopefully a good error message for what to do. In this case, it tells you to go install the, the version of um, CI Detect, I believe. No, ours was called CI Detect. The new one is called CI Info, which just tells you to go install CI Info um, instead. So I see that as a really positive outcome for our how we support open source, giving, uh, either giving stuff away or deprecating it. <laughs> I want, I, I love deprecating. I love deleting code, getting rid of code. So that kind of leads into the next thing of like, we want to do open source that inspires confidence across our users. Um, so um, yeah, you should immediately be able to tell from our repos whether it's supported or not. And the answer should always be yes, unless it's very, very obvious that it's not. Um, and that also means, I think confidence goes a lot to, um, we're able to build confidence by making everything um, look the same if it is supported. So there's no, there's currently no levels of support. It, like I mentioned, it's a binary. We had discussed internally whether we wanted to have like some other level of support, which indicated like we aren't accepting pull requests for this, we, but we are maintaining it. We will publish new versions. Um, and we found that was probably just going to be more work for us to like maintain a whole different level of support um, as far as like with a small team. So we just have decided to either deprecate or give something away or like fully support it, meaning um, we're committed to keeping it up to date, kind of with that whole list I showed at the beginning. We're committed to releasing it, um, fixing security vulnerabilities, um, keeping it up to date with any latest versions of Node. Um, there was a current change in Node 20 that changed how the exit code was, um, basically whether it was undefined or uh, I can't remember all the details. Someone else on the team ended up triaging it, but we fixed a bunch of our repos so the test would pass um, once we started testing in um, Node Nightly at that point. So that was another um, really positive outcome of like, since we support everything and test everything across our full matrix, we were able to be like, okay, this change needs to be made and then let's make it across all of our repos. Um, and so with a large open source portfolio, it is, 
um, inevitable that things will fall through the cracks. Um, uh, it's not possible, <laughs> it's not probable, like it will happen. All the things I've described so far, like those are just um, the times I've personally been responsible for things falling through the cracks. <laughs> um, and so with a team of multiple people, um, that can happen a bunch of, a bunch of different times. So um, we, another one I can think of is the time, like we've also had to abort a bunch of CLI releases. When we try to do um, weekly releases, for a while we were just in a cadence of um, hitting a bunch of CI issues or like differences across machines that were not scalable um, and just having to abort on releases until we could like figure out what was going on. Because we, the last thing we want to do is release something that decreases user confidence of like have a bunch of flaky releases in a row that like have some um, simple bugs that we're not catching because like we're not fully running CI or we're not confident in our CI. Um, and so that's, how do we do that? <laughs> I just said a bunch of words about like what we want to do. And I think I use the word like everywhere, everything, all the time. Like those are a bunch of like very absolute terms that are um, difficult to do in practice. Um, and so I've always wanted to come up with an acronym really badly and have it like become a thing. So hopefully next year someone gives a talk about PPAT um, is what I'm calling it. Uh, <laughs> Feel free to like, you know, rearrange those letters or come up with better um, synonyms and, and tap. Yeah. But tap's already a thing. Tap. 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 <laughs> so, like I said, um, I've always wanted to come up with one, which is why I probably never have and never will because I'm like really bad at naming things. But for the purpose of this talk and the purpose of um, coming up with uh, terms that I could put on slides <laughs> last minute. Um, patterns, process, automation, and tooling um, are the four umbrellas that I came up with of how we um, accomplish um, what we do so far. So, um, but yeah, just feel free to tweet at me or uh, toot at me with, with better acronyms. <laughs> um, so the first pattern is um, make everything the same or MPX it the same. Um, we used make for a long time in the CLI. Um, now we just kind of dog food the CLI with itself and with um, NPM itself to, to run a lot of our um, commands to keep everything the same. But um, there was like a lot of, um, as I mentioned before, there's still repos that I haven't committed to. So there's a lot of power in, it's really powerful to like clone a repo you've never been in before and have it feel familiar. Um, and so some examples of that are like even really small things like everything goes in a lib directory or a bin directory um, and we don't allow files anywhere else in our repos um, unless they've, you know, there's ability to whitelist or have an allow list of stuff. Um, but in general, like there's just one place you're gonna look for the, the entry point to um, a package or just any, any of the source code for a package for that matter. Um, and just the same linting, the same formatting, um, same CI workflows, all the CI workflows in every re repo are named the same thing. Um, so if you are running, you know, the same, if you want to check the action for something across two different repos, um, you can use a well-known URL, you know, well-known GH CLI command if you want to, to get the output of those um, logs for two different repos because everything's named the same. Um, and same with, um, we've had a lot of success with our change logs these days, um, <clears throat> which used to be non-existent in a lot of repos. Um, someone gave a talk yesterday about um, an annoying uh, uh, trend of, of projects having no change log, <laughs> and uh, that, we, we, we did that. Um, but <laughs> we, now, now we have change logs everywhere, and they're named the same thing in the same um, spot in the repo. I have the same headers. Um, if you, you know, I've even written you know, one-off tools that we use to like just parse our change logs because I know um, and that was easy to do. I didn't need a markdown parser or anything because I know like, you know, we have one hash for the title, two for the date, um, you know, three for the, the number of the release. Um, so it's like really powerful to have all of that be exactly the same um, across a bunch of repos. So the next time I go clone something like, uh, um, I've been in Semver a lot recently, but they were probably like the first year I didn't do anything in Semver. Um, and then when I first pulled it down for the first time, it was, uh, wildly different <laughs> than any of our other repos. Semver is kind of like um, the behemoth. It gets around one billion of those four billion um, downloads a month. So like a quarter of our downloads are just from Semver. So we take 
um, a lot of care <laughs> with changes we make in that repo. Um, Jordan um, has dissuaded me from some changes I wanted to make because I didn't realize like that they were breaking changes. Um, and when something is used, downloaded a billion times a month, like everything is a breaking change um, by the, the strictest definition we found. And again, we've been lucky enough that users told us that when I accidentally dropped node um, an odd number maybe like node 13 support accidentally um, out of the engines field. And like the next day there were issues open saying uh, this started throwing in CI because it doesn't support node 13 anymore. And I was like, that's an odd version well past uh, end of life anyways. But like, uh, you know, we did a patch that day to, um, you know, fix it. So those users wouldn't have failing CI anymore. So, um, but that was just another example of, uh, with, when things were different, it made it much more difficult to uh, make those changes. And obviously not everything can be the same because, you know, <laughs> we need different source code in our, our libraries. We need a bunch of different stuff. Um, and so when we do have differences, we try to reduce them or abstract them to the smallest possible surface area. So um, we have configs in a bunch of our um, packages and repos that will do things like... Um, switch it between C CJS and ESM. Um, so we, you know, always, we still publish C uh, CommonJS for everything, but we have a few like internal tools or like leaf packages that are just, um, that we can use ESM with because, you know, I think there were some dependencies I wanted to pull in. Um, and it's nice for like CLI tools if you're not expecting someone else to consume it, like things that we just publish as like other separate tools. Um, and so we have a config in our packages that can just switch between those two modes and make sure that like your linting files get named correctly, um, your, um, that we lint, that your file extensions are correct, like that we use MJS for um, ESM and stuff like that. Things that um, are gonna be different across projects, but you don't have to remember, you only have to remember to change that in one place in this project. Um, and if you forget to, like you're just gonna, you know, all linting and all tests are gonna blow up until you just switch that. So it's very discoverable. Um, that you need to change that config. You won't be able to get very far um, without it. And we are currently have um, an internal plan to adopt formatting across all our repos. Um, one thing that we found difficult is during, um, in reviewing community pull requests, there's like a lot of back and forth about formatting. Um, and so we don't want anyone to have to worry about that, especially when contributing. Um, we all, we've also found a big trend of like, people that just use the GitHub UI, like the dot, you press dot on a repo, you get to the dot dev, and they'll commit like typo fixes in our docs or just like um, typo fixes and comments. <clears throat> and they're not running any sort of linting or CI or have like, you know, a super robust, I mean, it is VS code in the browser, but like maybe they don't have VS code. They're not gonna go through a bunch of time to set up extension sync and have like a really robust dev environment there. Um, and so we found people will do that and then we'll have to pull down their pull request and update it for them, which is work that we're happy to do because we're enabling contributors, but um, there's tooling that can help with that, including like prettier um, and adopting that. So like if someone has a, a line that's too long, it just, CI will just fix that for them. Um, and we're experimenting with ways that like um, the pull request can detect whether um, the, the, the red, you know, if the pull request is in a red state, it can detect if it's a linting problem and then, you know, the GitHub action, the robot can fix it for us and push to that pull request um, without manual work and with, with, all, with also without dissuading contributors because we've definitely been very guilty of that in the past of um, leaving contributors on red, I believe as the kids say. Um, it's where, you know, someone it will have a really good change and we're just not able to get to it and um, it doesn't filter up as high in our notifications because it's a red, you know, CI is red and we're just, you know, you know it's going to be a bunch of work to go in and manually fix someone's pull request, um, which is, you know, we don't want to close it because we do, you know, value that contribution. But so far it's been difficult to do those without like um, these patterns I've been mentioning. Um, so here's an example of Sember where it has different engines and CI versions. Um, so currently we, we support the late, um, all the LTS versions of uh, 14, 16, 18, um, and then anything above 18. So like including 18, 19, and 20. But um, Semver um, supports everything above 10. And that means we wanna test in, all, in a bunch of new stuff as well. So this is just a config setting <coughs> that changes Semver to test in more stuff and provide more um, 
uh, node support uh, for more versions because um, we didn't want to do a breaking change. When something's downloaded a billion times a month, um, breaking changes are, are much more expensive as far as adoption goes. Like we can look at the download counts for old patch versions and old majors and see that like, you know, there's still hundreds of millions of downloads a month on old majors because, you know, projects that are never getting updated. So we don't want to um, do majors for re like really expensive majors when, when we don't have to. Um, so another thing we want to do is make adopting new patterns automatic. Like I mentioned, um, prettier. If we want that to be something across all our repos, um, that's just a, a robot. A ro like a, you know, prettier itself is just writing all of our files since they're all in the same place. Um, and we're uh, confident of like the standardization across all our repos, we can make that automatic. Like we don't even have to um, have any manual step um, to adopt prettier across all of our repos. So we recently did that with auto publish. <clears throat> so using granular access tokens, we're now auto publishing um, a bunch of CLI dependencies, not the CLI itself yet. We consider that one still like, you know, we, it's, it's good that it's manual. <laughs> we don't want to accidentally publish the CLI, but all of our dependencies now, as we update them, they get auto publish for free because that was just um, a GitHub workflow that has like, this was the diff for it basically to get added to um, our template, our templating repo. Um, and then it's across all repos that want it. And like I mentioned before, we abstracted that down to publish true as the config. So if you have published true to our templating config, um, the repo gets that because there are still some like Sember also. Um, actually, no, we did uh, do Sember once we felt confident with the approach across a bunch of other repos. Sember is now um, auto publish as well. So that was a big deal. And then there are always gonna be new patterns that are time intensive um, to do. So we wanna make those vi visible and measurable for our team. Um, so an example of this is coming up with the standardization approach was like a very time intensive task. We had to do it across all of our repos, um, one by one essentially um, manually because that was work that, um, I don't know, ChatGPT wasn't up to it at the time. <laughs> I haven't asked chat GPT-4 yet to do it for me, but uh, I, I'm still, you know, I'm still skeptical <laughs> that it that could do this. If it can, then, you know, maybe I can take a break. Um, another one we want to do is um, we haven't had time to support types for all of our packages, so we've been steering people towards definitely typed. And as great of a re community resource as that is, we still find that um, we get bug reports and unhappy users when we um, we follow Semver, so like even if we're publishing something that only we primarily use, if we're removing an API or doing something like that, we are updating a major version, and then types are slow to follow. Um, so then, if a user happens to be using that in a project, they will, um, you know, get the wrong types and and have a poor experience because you know I use VS Code daily, especially within VS Code, because um, it's just giving me a tele IntelliSense. Um, based on those types. So we want to start publishing our own types, but those are, again, like a lot of manual work that needs to be validated first. So um, we, our approach to that is kind of to add it to our status board as a new column. Um, and so this is a pull request uh, from last year where I removed um, the templating column from our status board because we actually finally templated everything, which meant we were confident in the node version it was at, um, and a few other things. So I got to remove all those com uh, columns from our status board because we no lo longer um, needed, needed to track those things. So kind of like as our status board gets more green, we're able to drop columns and then add new red columns <laughs> uh, to force us to do more work. Um, but it's good work and it, you know, it's, it's easy to make sure that we're um, doing it the right way because we'll validate the approach um, in one project and then make sure it scales and then we'll be able to track it here. So um, it was a really nice approach and it, you know, it's a nice uh, carrot <laughs> at the end of the stick for like going to this and seeing like one by one you're, you're making stuff green. Um, for a while I would go to it every morning because it's, it's a CI job that runs overnight. So like I'd go to it in the morning, make sure there wasn't any new, um, we also run a bunch of CI overnight to like check for new security vulnerabilities or even that like our tests aren't breaking due to transitive depths. Um, see Darcy's talk for what a transitive depth is. Um, um, but, you know, to check 
to check all those CI runs, but then also see like, you know, teammates were going and doing repos one by one. So we'd get to see, you can sort the status board by color. So you can say like, show me, you know, sort by red at the top and just see um, that number go down was like a, a really good feeling. And then dropping those columns was the best feeling because it's like, we don't, this is not something we need to track anymore. We, we did it, let's, you know, track something else. Um, and also we wanna make, make our process um, rotatable. Um, so we have everyone go see our, you know, everyone takes turns doing all these processes. So you'll never be like blindsided by um, a brand new process that you've never seen before. It's all incremental and you're free to like update the process while you're responsible for it. And so, you know, it's kind of like a fun surprise, but you know, it's all documented. So the next time for a while, like our release process was being overhauled, like pretty much every person that worked on it. So um, you'd get a, a new um, uh, a new like new documentation for what to do every time you ran the release, but it was all clear because um, we standardized it. So we also want to make all these process changes transparent. So we use um, the GitHub Wiki to kind of store playbooks for this stuff. And the one thing I want to highlight here is our release process has 222 revisions. <laughs> um, and so we keep we keep them in that we like the GitHub Wiki for this because like we don't want to um, force us to review these pull requests. They're just things that are um, someone can do, but it's, it's nice to have this um, audit log for it essentially. Um, and we also want these processes to be discoverable. So as I mentioned, this is the, our current release process and it opens a pull request for you um, and gives you check boxes and each command that you should copy and paste in your, to your terminal and run. Um, and this, you know, and it auto, it, it replaces anything that's uh, release specific. And so you really just copy and paste and um, as for the question is like, why can't a machine do this? And like for the ones we auto publish, a machine now can do it. But we consider the CLI um, too big of a target. We're like, we don't want to mess up or like have a process bug that we haven't um, thought about before, like run amok and have, you know, our release process become sentient or something and the CLI <laughs> releases itself a billion times and e eats all of our CI, I don't know. It, 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 it's been a while since I saw Terminator. Um, so um, the next is automation. We wanna um, have automation that we can kind of um, tweak and configure over time. So this is the current list of all of our um, config automations. Um, and hopefully this is, um, these tools are not prescriptive. Kind of everything in the first half of the talk, like those are the, the general, my general thoughts about open source and like kind of the themes of this. And all this is, um, is, I mean, it's open source. I don't know if I mentioned that yet. <laughs> you can go look at this, you know, decide to adopt this for your team or not. Um, it's currently very like fork friendly open source, um, which means like you could fork it and use it and we can collaborate on it if you want. Like there's a thing in the bottom of the repo for our tooling that says like, this works for us. Um, if it works for you, if it doesn't work for you, let us know. Um, and I believe I'm, I'm pretty much <laughs> at time. Um, but we have uh, one more tool I wanted to show off is our templating tool. Um, and so this is kind of like the path to profit <laughs> with our templating tool, which just means that it updates itself. So we use template OSS to tell Dependabot to watch for updates to template OSS. So Dependabot can apply template OSS updates everywhere. <laughs> um, that I tried to make a graph for that and I, I, I just, over. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a snake eating its tail, but in a, in a good way. Um, so this screenshot is our post Dependabot workflow that uh, template OSS writes to repos and then Dependabot runs. And then the very last line of it, you can see it runs template OSS apply. So we're in a constant state of getting all of our own updates. So here's one just for a single repo that updated it from 14 to 15. And then here's the rest that need to be um, merged. <laughs> so like this is how many um, re, uh, pull requests it opened. Um, again, uh, hopefully one day I can fit this on one slide. Like it keeps going down, um, but I couldn't. Um, and so the last thing I wanted to mention is just a quick plug for making <clears throat> your own tools and having a common set of tools. So we currently have, you need Node and the GHCLI um, and that's it to run stuff. No one installs them like this, but this was like the easiest uh, copy and paste way to install them without being, uh, with being a, a, as prescriptive, as non-prescriptive as possible. <laughs> so every, you're free to have your own opinions on how to install these things, but um, as long as you have them, you can run our tools. Um, and so we also have staff tools, again, open source. 
um, fork friendly, feel free to go through the repo, see anything you find diff um, interesting. Um, Wes, in case there's like people that want to do poly repo plus mono repo configuration solutions, <laughs> this would be the, the place to look. Um, and so this is just a bunch of screenshots of everything you can do with our staff tools that we wrote just as, as needed. Um, so this was just kind of ad hoc, as needed um, stuff. And these are all the places you can contact me. If you have a Blue Sky invite, let me know. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, no, no time for questions, but uh, feel free to grab me in the hall. Um, about anything. You were asking about that. Percentage. Oh yeah, um, Darcy had we had 2,203 releases over 130 main pro maintained project independencies for an average of 12.5 releases a week. So this was at December. I believe that was for all of 2022. We averaged 12, 12 and a half releases a week for a year. Um, yeah, we, we ship. Um, so let's collaborate on all this open source. As I said, it's either, it's all supported. If it, if it looks unsupported, yell at me, like tag me by name in repos, um, please. And let's collaborate in open source. And we also have, um, we need more people to help us do this now. <laughs> so if this sounds interesting to you, um, um, that URL will have some open job postings um, next week or feel free to come, come at me as well. Come at me, bro.